Hello everyone, my name is Bittu, I'm an Associate Professor of Biology and Psychology at Ashoka University and it uh, gives me great pleasure to um, send a short message about um, an aspect of science communication that the organizers have asked me to address, which is um, the question of um, gender fluidity, as they put it. Uh, for me, uh, more fundamentally, uh, perhaps the overall question of gender itself, uh, because um, gender is uh, a social construct that derives legitimacy from association with a biological category, sex. Um, and there's a lot about, uh, you know, biological sex and uh, gender that, uh, you know, uh, uh, that sort of information out there in the biology world, uh, which is still not uh, familiar uh, to many biologists uh, because it's not part of our curricula, it's not part of, um, uh, it's a very limited part of some medical curricula and even then uh, quite limited. So, uh, you know, uh, maybe I'll sort of just do a quick introduction to, um, to some things that many of you would already know um, and perhaps a few things that are somewhat surprising. Uh, and um, I'll end with this question of, uh, of what it is that we need to look at um, as scientists uh, when it comes to uh, addressing questions of um, gender and sex with respect to, of course, humans where uh, the consequences um, of thinking of uh, gender and sex as rigidly tied categories um, and uh, biologizing gender, uh, which is a social category, um, due to the, the link between uh, medically determined biological sex and the social construct of gender. Uh, something that's particularly difficult uh, or creates particular difficulties for people like myself who are transgender um, and other folks uh, who are intersex, uh, but also um, uh, for society more broadly, uh, for everybody to be subjected to a whole code of social stereotypes and labor expectations um, that are tied to um, certain parts of their body, which in fact uh, most human beings go to considerable lengths to cover up. Uh, do we really want to pa pattern uh, behavioral expectations into, into just two categories uh, across people just based on um, a medical reading of, um, of their bodies? Maybe not. Um, what in fact constitutes uh, maleness and femaleness, even at a physical level, in terms of um, biological sex? Um, bear in mind that um, just uh, the, the, the idea of um, anisogamy, that is to say the, the system of having uh, not one sort of uh, hermaphroditic form, um, but but multiple sexes uh, is not something that um, uh, it, you know. It's not sort of the norm across um, the living world. Um, many of you who've done dissections on plants in school, uh, because um, uh, you know at some point animal dissections were not um, encouraged, and plant dissections were instead. That was the case with my school. Uh, you would know that uh, many plants um, have. Um, bear male, male and female sexual organs on the same uh, flower. Um, several uh, you know, uh, invertebrates are um, hermaphroditic um, or have hermaphroditic forms. Um, and uh, you know, uh, with, with several kinds of um, single-celled organisms, you know, there are mating types, often multiple, uh, rather than um, you know, biological sex itself being binary. So. Um, uh, so you can have isogamy, you can have multiple form anisogamy, and we uh, mammals uh, exist in a particular form of isogamy that, uh, that largely involves two um, biological sex categories. And, um, uh, you know, uh, this is just one way of life um, in the living world, let alone the animal world. But even in this, um, in isogamous systems, uh, in non-isogamous systems, so binary systems of, of sex, um, uh, I'm hoping many of you know that there are multiple, uh, uh, you know, there are multiple steps of um, genetic regulation in the pathways that um, that lay down um, genetic differentiation um, uh, to produce these categories of biological sex, and multiple variations in these um, can lead to people being born intersex. Um, and uh, unfortunately, um, neither the medical uh, establishment nor uh, the biology establishment has really pushed. Uh, from an understanding of um, these natural variations for um, intersex um, infants and intersex people to, to have the right to self-determine uh, what happens to them. And um, unfortunately, to this day, uh, medical corrections 
corrections upon mm. intersex infants are routinely performed um and the lack of an understanding of how sex does or does not beget um gender often leads to not just physical but also um gender based um uh, social trauma for um for intersex um, children and 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 uh, those children as adults uh so when one even considers a binary um uh, you know sexual frame uh what do you think determines maleness versus femaleness um for most uh, people who listen to this talk and uh, for many scientists as well i mean maleness is um you know uh, maleness is often uh, defined as a certain set of um of genitalic uh, organs so a penis um and uh, we i mean of course uh, most people in developmental biology would certainly know that um uh, you know the the default sort of developmental program for everyone is um female typed as it's generally called and that um the influence of the SRY gene and, and several genes in cascade after that um uh, on the y chromosome are um Uh, lead to um, development of that same system into um, a more male type system uh, but do you think of the presence of a visible penis as being fundamentally definitive of uh, maleness uh, well even among mammals who are particularly sexually boring bunch by sexually boring i mean relatively you know binary uh, biological a uh, biological sex system uh one sees uh, examples uh, uh, that counter that go counter the, to this so for example the hyena where the female's clitoris is larger uh, than that of the male's penis she actually gives birth through the clitoris um uh and uh, often uh, the erect uh, clitoris is uh, for female hyenas a way of signaling dominance and um and they have other um uh, you know and to social status um so if if you know i'm trying to under, understand what what you might think of as definition in this you know it's important to remember uh, some things um, that uh, you know biologist uh, the famous trans biologist joan ruffgarden uh, pointed out in her book evolution's rainbow that it's in fact not the presence of a penile structure or giving birth which of course is uh, is female associated in um uh in mammals largely but uh is not fund- i mean uh, fundamentally definitional of maleness or femaleness in the animal world uh the famous uh, the favorite icon for trans folks um trans men like myself who uh, may want to give birth is um the seahorse um uh and for that matter lactation which is also something that's thought of as a um female biologically sexed uh thing in um uh in mammals uh is not uh, unique to females so uh, males can lactate for example um you know dark fruit bats um in dark fruit bats males lactate as well uh and certainly uh, you know others one already knows that there are several examples in the animal world uh of um uh of you know males being larger sized uh, than females and so on uh, just not holding up as a generalized rule of maleness and femaleness So what then is definitional to maleness and females what you know what across species uh when there is a binary non isogamous um uh, you know uh, mating type um a set of mating types um in a species what defines which one is male and which one is female um as joan points out in her book really foundational to this um uh, differentiation is actually just gamete size so uh the fundamental difference is that males have tiny little gametes and females have large gametes so this of course means that in many uh, several small animals the female is much larger than the male because her gametes take up a very large fraction of her body and they themselves are very large things um and a lot of people also don't know that there are some really fantastic examples in the animal world uh, of animals that don't um um you know because you know that there are several organisms that are hermaphroditic but there are also several organisms that change their gender over a lifetime so many of you know that um with some with some crocodilians and some uh, fish uh, and some frogs uh that temperature can actually regulate um the biological sex um that organisms um Uh, express and that these can be epigenetically controlled and not genetically um uh, not just genetically uh but uh, there are some uh, you know uh, uh, nemo the clownfish uh, that you would have seen in 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 the cartoon finding nemo um is a type of fish that actually uh, uh, where males can actually undergo a transformation during their lifespan so immature males can actually become females if the females uh, if sort of um, uh, 
other females in the group die off. Uh, and likewise, among ras fish, um, you can have uh, there's a there's a, a third mating type consisting of a female to male transformed mating type, which um, sort of somewhat um, uh, you know. Uh, uh, you know, sat satisfyingly is much larger than the um, and more dominant than the uh, biologically um, natally uh, male uh, type uh, in rasafish. And so I say all this just to give you a quick flavor of how much variety there is in the animal world and how, uh, you know, our standard uh, framework of, of what we think of as immutable biological sex uh, stands on somewhat different grounds um, if one looks at the evidence uh, across species um, than, than we think of as uh, in, in our sort of immutable and very mammalian uh, sort of um, uh, framework. Uh, and. Um, you know, uh, we as trans folk um, also uh, play an important kind of um, uh, role in appending some of these uh, these ideas because um, we're people, at least for me, I'm somebody whose uh, brain's expectation, somatosensory expectation of my body is um, that of a sort of typically male patterned body. Um, this is what I mean when I say I'm trans. Uh, there's very little understanding out there in the scientific community of what it means for people uh, to say that uh, we are trans. Um, so for me, uh, in the same way that you would have a sense of your arm extending from your body and you would have an expectation that that arm is there and people who sometimes face amputations, uh, you know, uh, feel the, the phantom limb even if it's not there. Uh, as um, Bias Ramachandran has pointed out, this is also something that can um, be applied to thinking about um, transness and several trans folks experience phantom body parts or feel that body parts exist despite a lack of um, a very disconcerting sort of lack of expectation uh, of their existence uh, and this uh, combination of traits can be quite sort of just sensorily distracting uh, sometimes um, uh, really disconcerting um, and then of course on top of that if one has to deal with a society um, that expects that because one's body is a certain way one has to then behave in certain ways labor in certain ways um, you know, um, uh, and sort of conform to a whole host of social expectations, uh, you know, that uh, and then and really any deviation from any of those uh, norms is sort of severely socially punished and questioned and ridiculed. Then you have the additional social uh, layer of um, uh, dysphoria that um, one has to deal with as a trans person. So I will just say this, um, as biologists, all of us have a responsibility um, to keep, uh, to really sort of inform ourselves of the literature on uh, biological sex and its variations, um, to ensure that um, surgery on intersex uh, children and the suppression of um, expression of trans identity um, uh, among children and, and adults um, stops. Uh, and uh, we also have likewise a responsibility to uh, rethink uh, what we think of as uh, immutable about the connection between sex and gender. And um, really, I would posit that uh, we're all people with different bodies and we may even have uh, a, ver a ver variety of brains, but we know that you can't um, simplistically uh, look at a brain and decide whether it is male typed or female typed uh, once the categories are laid down one finds a lot of correlates but uh, we also know that brains are heavily shaped by experience and so it's not until biologists biologists are not going to get answers to a lot of questions until we really start looking at what a level, level social playing field uh, for people across body types is and i would really sort of encourage you to think about what it would mean to have a world in which one's body is one's body and it has nothing to do with the social expectation um, or uh, assignment of labor um, uh, and uh, you know people can make decisions uh, about what they want to do with their bodies without being policed um, and really uh, uh, the idea being that uh, as with with so many other things you know some of us have uh, bodies um, that um, uh, you know, some of us are left-handed, some of us are right-handed. Um, in the old days, this would be something that would be a cause for, for um, persecution. And now we just understand that there are left-handed and right-handed people. And this doesn't necessarily translate to our expectations of um, uh, them, either in terms of labor or in terms of um, the kinds of jobs they can do or the kinds of, uh, you know, social expectations we have of them. So I'm hoping that gender can be like this, um, um, that it can really become obsolete. Uh, uh, and uh, that we stop tying our um, uh, uh, social expectations of, of people's behaviors to their bodies. All right, thank you very much for listening.